What a wonderful day. I mean, just sitting through here, watching things. So I, I, I've decided to completely change my talk. No, no. Uh, but in, in looking at it, uh, I am going to do some things. I love the improv. So I'm going to go fast forward and fast back and fast forward. So I'm going to take advantage <laughs> of some of those things. And um, what I want to talk about today is maybe a little bit about life. And uh, as we go through uh, the path in life, the things that we think are going to happen may not, and, uh, and wondering about where we may go and taking advantage. I'm an educator, taking our advantage in our minds and looking at answering questions along the way. And I'm still struck by that x-ray with, uh, uh, with the nail. Um, I had a similar experience. My, f my first year in college, week four, didn't know anybody. We go on a the geology field trip, and I'm climbing on some obsidian, and I cut my middle finger to the bone and I'm profusely bleeding, and the instructor has to load everyone up in the bus, and we have to go to the hospital, and they wait while I'm in, having my stitches done. <laughs> I'm wondering if I'm ever going to have a career in earth sciences. Um, so uh, what I want to do is I want to start um, today, and then I'm going to go back in time. And uh, this is an editorial from the uh, Dallas Morning News on Monday. And it talks about earthquakes in Dallas. I came to Dallas in 1983. Um, I studied nuclear explosions and ground motion. I didn't think I would study um, earthquakes here in Dallas. And so what I want to do is I want to go back in time then and talk about this story and talk about how it involves science, how it involves the public, and, uh, and talk about how we solve problems. And so uh, that's, uh, that's our, our goal. So uh, I teach one of the first year intro classes that uh, general science kids have to take. So they're not all real happy to be in there. It's, science, it's earthquakes and volcanoes. They call it shake and bake. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, but it's an opportunity to, and in the fall of 2008, I was teaching that course, and on Thursday night, um, we in Dallas had the first felt earthquakes that have ever occurred in 150 years. And I thought, terrific. What an opportunity. Tomorrow morning when I go into class, I can finally talk about real-time earthquakes that some of the students had felt, and uh, um, what an opportunity to, to bring it close to home. Little did I know where that path would go. And so I want to take you through that path. This is just a, a picture of earthquakes. That night, there were about 100 earthquakes. And uh, you can see over the course of from November until May, there were a series of sequences of, of earthquakes um, that began to occur here in the Dallas area where we had never felt earthquakes before. Um, and so in that thread with the students, the idea was, well, let's go study those earthquakes just because we want to understand something about them. And uh, so uh, we... Uh, got some portable instruments. We deployed instruments out to try to locate the earthquakes better than the USGS. And sure enough, about May of that year, this outline right here is the DFW airport. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, the uh, west east runway and the west runway. And when we located those, those earthquakes, they all occurred right here. Look at the scale. That's only like about a mile. And you can see the, that little linear trend. Those were, and they were all about four and a half kilometers deep, about three miles deep, all on that little little trend there. I said, curious, you know, what what's going on? What? And so as we as we began to look at these things, these red circles are all the producing um, wells um, on the airport, and then these w blue squares are two places that when we produce oil and gas. We separate the oil from the water, and then we dispose of the water, and that was a wastewater injector. Um, it just turns out to be right where that location was. Again, curious. And so we go a step further, and uh, the Texas Railroad Commission keeps track of these kinds of processes. So this is a, this is a problem solving. And, uh, and so that particular injector had begun injecting water in the subsurface at about four and a half kilometers deep on the 12th of September. And that first earthquake began on the 31st of October, and then the earthquakes <coughs> began to occur over this time period. If we think of earthquakes, um, 
Water um, can accelerate the release of tectonic stress on existing faults. And so it, over this time period, we came to conclude that possibly that wastewater was triggering these earthquakes. We shared this data and uh, you can see that uh, in this particular image, in August that, that water well, that disposal well was abandoned. So there was a conversation of these processes. Now, we're gonna take, now this is the rewind part. So that's 2008, so now we're gonna rewind. We're gonna rewind to 1975. And, uh, and we're also gonna take our, our lens and instead of looking at Dallas, we're gonna expand across the Eastern United States. And so um, this map, maybe some of you, if you've had a geology class, this is a map of the United States. These are earthquake hazards across the United States. You can see the San Andreas Fault, the subduction, you can see this broad tectonic region. Red means higher risk from earthquakes. When we look to the eastern United States, we see that in general, the colors are much lighter, there's less earthquake risk. And, um, and that's because active tectonics doesn't play a strong role in the eastern United States. And so if we look at earthquakes in the eastern United States, this is the number, cumulative number of magnitude three earthquakes from 1975 to 2015. I don't care if you're a scientist or who you are, if you look at that plot, that looks like pretty much a linear line. So that means the same number of earthquakes per year. So 20 magnitude threes from 1975 until about 2008. And in 2008, some people call this the hockey stick. Uh, but in 2008, we see this rapid rise in seismicity. That rapid rise in seismicity, what, what's, what's, what's the cause? I think we now are coming to a conclusion that the same thing we saw out at the DFW airport is occurring, particularly to our neighbor to the north in Oklahoma, where they have over an order of magnitude more water that they have to dispose of than we have here and that this may be related to the disposal of wastewater fluids. Okay, I'm gonna go backwards again. And so now we're gonna go back to 1962. So this lesson about wastewater disposal and injection of earthquakes is something that uh, the, the um, literature, and I think this is a lesson for us all, at least in my mind, makes me think about, I always need to be learning and thinking about new things, this is uh, just south of Denver, Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. And um, in uh, 1962, uh, the U.S. began to dispose of, this is millions of gallons of uh, chemical waste that was associated with chemical weapons. And, uh, and fortunately, they thought enough to put some seismic stations in and measure the number of earthquakes that were occurring in the area as they disposed of those fluids. And so you can see the rapid rise of injection, the rise of earthquakes, the decay of injection, the decay of earthquakes, the rise, the decay. And you can see that the earthquakes and the fluids follow each other. They stop. The earthquakes decay. They don't go away. They come back up again. And, and so back 50 years ago, this idea that when fluids flow onto faults, we can change the effective stress um, that the, uh, the faults can slip more easily, just like us on a day when we're driving in the rain, it's a rainy day, and our, our tires can slip on, on the faults. Um, now, we're gonna go back to Texas, 1975. Today, this is the number of earthquakes, and you can see the rise in, in earthquakes in Texas, and actually throughout the state of, of Texas. Um, so the question, why, why, this, why this sudden increase in, in 2008? One of the wonderful technological solutions to our, our, our energy problems are, this, are these ideas of hydrofracking, breaking rock, and recovering oil and gas, primarily gas initially, in these, in these materials, and, uh, and providing us some energy independence. And, these basins across the United States are places where those kinds of things are going on. When we do that, we recover some water with that, with that oil and gas. And we have to separate that water, and that water is very salty, has lots of brines, um, and so typically we dispose of it underground um, 
in, in most environments. And uh, that revolution provided the opportunity for increased disposal of fluids um, in a number of places, Texas and Oklahoma, among those as, as we've gone forward. Okay, back to Texas. 2008, what's, what's happened uh, since 2008 um, in Texas? An area with the Fort Worth Basin where again, going back to about 1850, we have no written records of, of any earthquakes. Um, we've had 32 magnitude three earthquakes over that period, one magnitude four, over 200 earthquakes now in the Fort Worth Basin um, that uh, um, have occurred. And so illustrating that these, this kind of increase in earthquake activity that we see other places is ongoing here. For us in, in, in DFW, uh, we, uh, the airport earthquakes were, were here. Uh, we've had a sequence of earthquakes in Azel. We've had a sequence of earthquakes here on the border between um, Dallas and Irving down here in Venus. And so all of these yellow dots are, are earthquakes that are ongoing. Um, the inner unanticipated outcomes. Back on that night in the 30th of October, 2008, I was excited. This, this is the path to try to understand these things. And I, I think it's a path that maybe some of you have felt these events, um, that all of us participated in trying to understand and how to mitigate these effects. And even here in Texas now, the state legislature has uh, um, found this to be important enough to, to generate something called TexNet, where um, state funds are now going forward to begin to try to assess these things and understand this, this linkage of induced earthquakes. So it's, it's a multi-disciplinary, um, um, it's kind of an exciting kind of thing in that it involves people from industry, their understanding of these problems, it involves economic issues, it involves you and I as, as residents here in Dallas. Um, you never know where you're going to end up. And uh, I don't know how many of you opened up the uh, Dallas Morning News on Sunday. Um, and uh, these two images were uh, in the uh, Sunday morning paper. These are um, impact now of uh, a magnitude 4.8 earthquake and a magnitude 5.6 earthquake. The possibility of that on the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, we live in an area that uh, historically has had no earthquake hazards. Our building codes are a little bit different than in California. And so uh, it behooves us, whatever the cause, always thinking about what might be the implications to, to think about these. And so FEMA has run these uh, scenarios of a magnitude 4.8 and a magnitude 5.6. Um, just to put this into one dot is $10 million worth of damage. And, uh, and so uh, these, these are significant kinds of impacts. Now, the probability of these are low. And so for all of us, as we try to think about problem solving, these low risk but possible high outcome kinds of things, what should I think about? What should, I, what, what should be our problem solving approach to, to these kinds of efforts? Um, it's a broad based problem solving kinds of thing. We have to think of all the consequences. This morning, we heard about Richard Nixon and the consequences of, of one single educational bill. And so I think that this is an example of where uh, we, have, we have to be quantitative and we have to think about our things and uh, think about what the implications of increased earthquakes are. This um, is a, a picture of one of the largest crude oil terminals in the United States. It's, it has a strategic characteristic for the United States in Cushing, Oklahoma, in a region where there have been increased earthquakes. And so it behooves us to think about what are the problems, how can we solve these things. Um, interdisciplinary kinds of things are the place that we can do these. Not everyone agrees with the, uh, um, all of the, uh, um, um, how, these, how these different interpretations go along the way. But I think that's, that's the other lesson that I come away with as we think about problem solving. This is a report that uh, involves the US oil and gas industry, it involves regulators, it involves people like me that study earthquakes, trying to understand what the implications are of these events. And so uh, these are the kinds of steps. We don't have all the answers. Never in life do we always have all the answers. 
And uh, that day I cut my finger, I wish I would have had the answer that I had not put my hand on that obsidian ledge when I reached up to those processes. But in my mind, the opportunity to try to solve problems in an interdisciplinary way. And so uh, with that, I think I'm gonna end, except that uh, in, the, in the spirit of TED, and I've never given a TED talk, as you can tell, right? <laughs> um, uh, but I think in the spirit of, of TED talks, the things that come at us in life provide an opportunity to learn and to discuss things and, and provide us a, an ability to, to problem solve. Um, in this particular case, I've had the, the opportunity to interact with other seismologists, other geologists, um, political uh, officials, um, um, oil and gas industry people, people like you, you who have felt the earthquakes. And uh, I, I think by walking through those doors, we have opportunities to learn and develop our, our understanding of the world in which we live. So thank you.